What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 714, with today's guest, Master Carlos Machado. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. All of them, any of them. Doesn't matter where they come from, doesn't matter how they're trained. If they're traditional, that's what we're here for. And we don't even define traditional, we let you define that. Why? Because we believe traditional martial arts make people better you want to see all the things that we're doing to that end head on over to whistlekick.com we've got a bunch of stuff going on it's all linked or referenced or in place there and check out our store as one of those things looking for i don't know training program or some apparel i don't know there's all kinds of i should know i know <laughs> there's all kinds of good stuff check it out use the code podcast15 it's going to get you 15 percent off everything in the store now the show, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, gets another website, a website all to its own, and that is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, as you might expect, because we name things very simply. And what are you going to find over there? Well, you're going to find every episode we've ever done, all of them. You're going to find transcripts. You're going to find videos and links and things like that. Why, Jeremy, why would I care about transcripts? You ever wonder, you know, I heard somebody say something on a show a year ago. Who was that? And what was it exactly they said? That's why we have transcripts. You can go, you can search there. It makes it much easier. Why do we do what we do to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artist of the world? If you like what we do, if you want to support us, you could buy something. You could tell people about what we're doing. Those are great options. We also have a Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. You can get in as little as two bucks a month. At $2 a month, you find out who's coming on the show, and we have tiers that go up from there. All kinds of great stuff. The top tiers even include a school owner's mastermind. It's pretty solid. So um, I think you should check that out and all the other things that we do. Now, today's guest, there's a very good chance that you know him by name. And if not, you're probably going to listen to this episode and say, oh yeah, wait, I I did know that name. Because I think it's difficult to be a martial artist in the West without having heard that name. But maybe there's some of you out there, no judgment regardless it's a wonderful conversation i had a great time and i hope you enjoy it hello sir hello my friend how are you doing i'm great how are you doing good here man uh glad to ha- to be part of uh this awesome podcast right now man glad to have you on our podcast you know you but when andrew reached out and said hey guess who's coming on the show and he told i was like no way Awesome. Yeah, he's a street talker, that guy, man. <laughs> yes, he me. is. Yeah. Be careful. Don't leave your wallet out around him. <laughs> talk yet. Uh, he's, he's a good dude. We've, we've, we've had some absolutely wonderful guests over the last year and a half since he joined the, the show, and, and I owe him yeah. so much. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm all ears and uh, uh, looking forward to a great conversation. Yeah. Well, if, if you're okay with it, I'd love to dive right in. Let's go in, man. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do it. No, right. no, no holds bar. Let's do it. <laughs> no puns intended there or anything. I'm no sure. puns intended. <laughs> Take no prisoners. No, none. Never. All right. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a question that you probably don't get too often. Okay. Why are you still training? Okay. Why so do you continue the- Okay, uh, how that put? Uh, th- there are, I guess, three different stages in your life when you do martial arts. Uh, you're a student; you want to learn it, and you have different reasons to do it. You know, uh, m- maybe your parents decided it was a good activity when you're a kid. You're being bullied in school. Uh, as an adult, uh, you want to feel more confident, or you got bored to doing workouts at the gym. You want something more exciting; could be a hobby. Me, I didn't have much of a choice when I started. Mm. Uh, it was part of the being part of the family, you know, related to my cousins, first degree uh, cousins to, to the Gracies, you know, learning from them since uh, I could barely walk. Uh, so, and, and having the siblings, the, the positive sibling rivalry, uh, mm. and also with the cousins in the sense that if I slacked, my brothers or my cousins would go much further ahead of me. So anytime I went back to train, so there was a, a different, uh, I guess, uh, reason behind it in, in that part of my life where everything was just taken for granted. You know, we're here and we're part of this family. We're going to do it because everybody else does. Okay. Uh, once you grow into the knowledge and then I guess you compete, you want to prove yourself. 
make your coach proud, make your parents proud. You know, there's the other aspect. But I became an assistant instructor since I was a blue belt. I was 16. I mean, I was already helping my then instructor uh, teach some of the beginners and stuff. Uh, and I, I enjoyed doing it. You know, for me, it was always enjoyable. Uh, and, and once I became a black belt, and then I went to New York, came to, the, to America, had my own school, and then separated from my brothers there in California. I was the first one to come to Texas. There was a degree of mission. You know, your, mm. your, your uh, purpose sometimes gets expanded. Man, I'm here by myself now. There's no cousins around, no brothers around. I, I might as well do all I can to make sure I make it right. And so, so there was a sense of mission. And when you have a sense of mission, okay, the reason I train, there's two aspects. One, personal. I want to be healthy and it intrigues me. You're just like a chess game. So yeah. it keeps you going. And refining my knowledge, knowledge, excuse me. So I can pass on to my students a better version of my martial art than what I learned. So I, I, I don't want my student to be like me. I want my student to be way beyond me. Mm. So I cannot just give them what I've got. I got to polish the diamond and give it as shiny as I can so he can keep on doing it. So if you ask me, the, the personal is part of my lifestyle. I do because it's a healthy thing. And, and the other one is a sense of mission. I want to make sure that I'm always upgrading my skills. I don't want to have the student ask me a question that I don't have the answer. I want to, even if I don't have the answer then, I want to work so I can find it. Okay. So kind of like, I'm not sure if that answers, but uh, somewhat on that. It, it, it does and it doesn't. And that's the beauty of our format. My job is just yeah. to keep you talking. Yeah. You, what, I, what I'm hearing is a perpetual value of knowledge mm -hmm. that you're just, you're just continuing to look to learn. So my, I think a question that, that I have, I suspect a lot of people would have at this point, because you've been doing what you've been doing for a while, because you are considered a pioneer in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world, who are you learning from? You know, it's funny you said that because there are two, two actually so many, uh, I guess, available resources nowadays. So I learned from whoever I trained with in the past. As, as an instructor, you are relearning what you know every time you pass your knowledge. You know, your students, as they build up their skill level, you're not giving them a fish, you're giving them a hook. You know, I try to give people not just uh, the knowledge of a technique that I know, I try to pass on the approach in which I try to develop my techniques so they can on their own become somewhat, not just uh, students of mine, but uh, they develop the art with, with their own input. You know, everything molds and is integrated. For instance, knowledge, I, you don't, you, I pass you a move, you, you might do exactly the way I do it, but you're gonna have a few things that you're gonna add to based on your body type, your inclination, whatever it is. So you integrate uh, what you got from me into yourself and you start to own that technique. So I've, I've taught, let's say, an arm bar to a student that I was really good at. That student eventually became better than me at the arm bar. He started to develop different ways to set it up and this and that. So this, the, it's kind of like a recycling of knowledge. When I teach, I'm relearning mm -hmm. uh, in the process because it's repetitive. And then by giving my students the ability to develop their technique on their own, independent of what they learn from me alone, they give back to me something of a better product or a finished product along the way. So, and, you know, of course you can also learn from all the different resources, you know, you can buy sure. instructionals, you have streams everywhere, YouTube, how to's, whatever. But I think you have to be mindful though, when you're developing, if you don't have an approach, you start to borrow knowledge from a lot of people without integrating. And that mm -hmm. can cause you to become uh, what I call a jujitsu Frankenstein. You got a bunch of pieces of different people, but they are not integrated. They're just pieces that somewhat, they don't look right. You know, you, you can tell that they're kind of like, uh, you know, not, not connected, you know, to the core, so to speak, you know, so. Yeah, there, there are a lot of worlds, martial arts being one of them, where people, you know, they're happy to plunk down the money. They're, they're happy to 
you know, go learn the thing at a seminar one time, but they don't want to put the reps in on the mat. They want to, they don't want to go back and put in the hours to, as you say, integrate and make that thing that they just learned or that YouTube video that they just watched part of their own expression of martial arts. And mm -hmm. Frankenstein's pretty vulnerable. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not, it, it, I, I always say there's a day of reckoning that comes mm -hmm. to all of us. Okay. When you make the assumption that by adding pieces without integrating will make you better. Uh, it doesn't mean that the volume of knowledge will make you more capable, but when you go against somebody that you might have neglected uh, how to connect and integrate your knowledge, you're going to always have holes. You're going to have holes that are going to be exposed. There is an expression in jujitsu, the mat never lies. Mm -hmm. It reveals your weak, it reveals your strengths as much as it reveals your weaknesses. Yeah. You know, so in a lot of instances, uh, you know, the worst thing for me is like if you think you know something and you actually don't know it all the way, you know, so you might get away with it for a while against a lesser person or a lesser opponent, you know, uh, but eventually you're going to be exposed. You know, I, I have a lot of guys that have great guard that I've seen black belts who are champions, but they can't escape if the guy passes their guard. Mm. So it's ironic because they, they got used so much to keep people in a certain situation that. They neglect working on other situations that, you know, sometimes it's easy for you to understand why, because they're not exposed to those situations often enough. You know, I give an example here and I'm, I'm not going to say names, but there's a, a very uh, accomplished black belt from Brazil who was the reigning champion uh, for over three and a half years. This was like a few years back. And that guy was the top of his academy nobody would he hadn't been tapped for like almost four years wow. the last time anybody got him in the submission you know and i'm not saying this is anything right or wrong it is yeah, what sure. it is the guy was great there was one day another black belt showed up and tapped him three or four times in one single match you know in the academy not a competition that person was so distraught, the black belt that was the top guy of the gym that was not tapping for years, he got so distraught that uh, there was a tournament about to happen. He didn't even want to compete. Mm -hmm. He was like, he's, he mentally was, how can that happen to me? He destroyed it. You know, so, so it kind of like, you, you got you to gotta understand that there's a reality. If you're not getting tapped, it's not because there aren't people qualified to get you there. It's because you're not exposing yourself to enough people that will put you in a situation that you need to be, you know what I'm saying? And for instance, all my students, I always like to bring them back to reality. If I see a guy who's getting really good, you know, and stuff, I'm going to try to break that guy a little bit in a positive way. Either I'll put the guy to go rounds in a row with enough people that he starts to wear himself out. And then I put another person, the top notch to go last. So he can be used to being in a bad position, mm -hmm. even if he's a top guy of the class. Other situations is uh, start working worst case scenarios. You start on the worst possible case scenarios. Even if you're the top guy, nobody ever gets close to getting you anything. You have to willingly start in disadvantage often enough that you don't lose track of being uh, aware of those situations, you know, and being somewhat in a state of mind that you feel untouchable, you know, so. That makes, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, I, I one of the things we talk about on this show often is is ego and and how destructive mm -hmm. it can be if it's if it's leveraged right you know if it's if it's motivational it can be great but you know you told that anecdote about someone for whom you know there it sounds like their their whole identity had been wrapped around them being the best and all of a sudden at least in that moment they weren't the best and they didn't know what to do as someone who has coached trained many over the years is that something that you try to, are there things that you do to try to prevent that from happening? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. As an instructor, if you teach techniques, if you teach people how to fight, if you teach people the martial arts and you don't work on the mindset, mm -hmm. you're given uh, a couple of situations. One, you're gonna have a person that will have the maturity as they grow into the ranks 
to stay humble and focused, but you are also going to give room to uh, create monsters. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're going to create people that when they feel they're getting good, they think they are above the average. They are better than everybody else, that it's them and nothing else. And, and it becomes a monster in itself, if not put in check early enough. And it's sad because in those situations, I mean, all of us, we don't know everything, you know, when you're born, you know, like I, as an instructor, a lot of things that I didn't know I, that now I learned through all the years, looking back, I could have been a better mentor, not just mm-hmm. a better instructor to some of those guys that their sheer talent and gifts became a curse to them because left unchecked, their ego became their own enemy. So they became their worst enemies. So there's a lot of great talent in everything, including martial arts, in particular jujitsu, that they not do not fulfill their potential to the fullest mm-hmm. because they fall prey to their own selves. You know, and as an instructor, I take blame for it if I don't at least give enough of uh, the education that they need in order to understand that, you know, uh, you know, you, you got to understand that it's not you alone. There's a whole army of people that are there with you, all your teammates or your training partners or your instructors. There's a, a whole group of people. You're never alone and you're never successful alone. But if you carry on, you know, and, and you become successful from a martial arts point of view, always keep your ego in check. And uh, our first motto, all, all the Machado Academies always had the motto, leave your ego at the door. That was like our first school. First thing that we put, the first article we ever were uh, covered in the United States, I think it was 1991, you know, that we did it. I'm not sure if it was, uh, I try to remember the martial arts magazine, not, not inside Kung Fu, it might have been another one. But in any case, the name of the article was Leave Your Ego at the Door. Mm. You know, it established our mindset and our culture right, right then. Every school we had that paint on our walls and so on. More recently, because I also take longevity in consideration, I, I kind of modified a little bit and I said, stay humble, train smart. Okay, so you have to add another element that uh, has to go along with it because depending upon how you train, jujitsu won't have a long lifespan. You know, it's hard on your body. Although you don't get hit, you know, and knocked out or getting concussions as often as you're doing striking arts, you get a lot of twists, a lot of uh, pressure on your joints that if, depending how intense you do it, how often, is going to shorten your, your time, mm-hmm. you know, on the mats. And, you know, in addition to the wear and tear that happens to everybody's uh, physical abilities as they grow older. Okay, so it shouldn't be that way, you know, mm-hmm. so... Where did that come from? Is that how you were raised in jujitsu, or was that that humility? Is that something that you discovered later on? Okay, so I have always been somewhat. People ask me why you do what you do. I said, man, I'm a lover, not a fighter. You know, I I'm a poet, not a fighter. I always got, I always enjoyed reading uh, philosophy, and I had great mentorship from the late patriarch Carlos Gracie Senior, Grandmaster. Carlos Gracie Sr. When I went to law school for a time period in Rio, I used to live under his uh, his roof, you know, because my family was living out of town. So I went to live with my uncle and my aunt. And literally, I shared great conversations with him all the freaking time. Mm. You know, I always enjoyed when I was a kid, if I went to a party, uh, to talk to the older crowd, you know, see what, what experiences they had to share, what life uh, lessons they had to share. So it has always intrigued me. Uh, b- before I came to America, uh, the last interaction I had live with uh, my uncle, he died four years later after I arrived. He said, remember, be humble when you get there. Be humble. You know, he, the last thing I heard from his mouth face to face. And uh, I never forgot that. You know, so there's an inclination uh, that I guess I was always going towards that direction. I, I always wanted to learn the philosophical aspect of the art. And one of the main thing, things in martial arts is respect. That's the first thing you learn, man. You got you to respect. And how do you gain respect is by giving it first, okay? And hum- humility uh, is in your best interest in the sense that it keeps your mind open. 
You know what I'm saying? You're not there to prove anything. You're, tr- you're there to grow. Some days will be better than others. Some days you're going to be a hammer. Some days you're going to be a nail. <laughs> and, and once you learn how to be comfortable with the uncomfortable and face things without worry about results, but just measuring, am I getting better despite my bad experience today? You become more resilient and you, you kind of go through the situations with a lot more grit and a lot thicker skin. That's what we say. Because guys that have big ego, they're weak. You know what I'm saying? That's insecurity, 100%. Wow. If, if you have an ego, I don't care how good you are, you're an insecure person. Because a confident person, it, it doesn't coexist. I cannot be confident because confidence comes from competence. Competence comes from consistency. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done something long enough. You went through enough times the ordeal of trying to work your, your trade or sharpen your 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 blade so so now you know what you're capable of you don't have to brag about it you don't have to show the world you just show them when you act not by talking about it you know but it's of, of course there are so many different influences that can take place and a lot of times uh you see celebrities in hollywood not trying to make a, a comparison but if they have a fast rise in their career and they are like unknown one day and then they do one hit and all of a sudden, everybody talks about them. It, it, success can come so fast that they don't have time to mature, to deal with it. So it becomes an animal in itself. You know? So I think the mindset approach, uh, I'm not trying to extend this answer, but uh, every class, I remind the guys, once you get really good, instead of trying to brag about it, show everybody else what you're doing so they can become good as well. The, the quality of your skills depends 100% on the quality of the people you practice with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, make everybody good. Don't just be a one-man show. So you bring an ally and start trying to, to allow somebody to become a click, you know, so mm-hmm. to speak, you know, so. It reminds me, I had an instructor many years ago who, who once said that in that moment before a fight happens, you know, when everybody's posturing and puffing up and, and doing that kind of monkey dance that it's the person who doesn't seem stressed they don't need to puff up that they just remain calm that's the person you most need to watch out for that's the one you definitely don't want to fight because they're not concerned and that was what you were saying was reminding me of that that you know as we train we should have less ego it should fade because we become a better version of ourselves we understand who we are and I think when we, when we look at a lot of the, the current crop of martial artists, especially within competition, and it's not just in jujitsu, it's, it's broader, but jujitsu takes the rap for it quite often, that you see a lot of these people, you describe them as monsters, that they have amazing technical skill, but they're not very good people. Yeah, I guess that's another thing that you mentioned. Uh, I always say on and off the mats, right? Mm. Being a good fighter, a good student should translate in, into becoming a better person when you're out about, you know, in your daily life. And it's a, a, a somewhat of a contrast that I, I really don't understand. Because if you're a true martial artist, uh, performing the martial arts well shouldn't be the only aspect of it. But using the martial arts to become a better person, ultimately, that's the greatest goal that we can all achieve, you know? If a kid becomes more confident through martial arts, they become, become they will become likely more competent in any other, in many other areas that they might pursue. But uh, I, I see, it scares me a little bit when I see different instructors, not being judgmental because nobody's perfect. I, I make mistakes and I'm susceptible to criticism like everybody else. But I'm mindful when it comes to how I behave outside the mats because I feel I have a position that I can influence a lot of people. So I'm mindful. It's not that I'm worried about what other people think of me. I'm more concerned about uh, causing uh, negative repercussions on the legacy I'm trying to build, okay? So, uh, I mean, when you have legacy in mind, you become a, a lot more mindful of your actions now. You know what I'm saying? Because your eyes are really stretching towards the future too, not just what's going about here. And just to elaborate or finish what I was saying, 
Yeah. I mean, I go to a lot of trade shows. I go, I go to a lot of uh, martial arts events here and there. I do seminars and lectures nationwide. You know, we have uh, instructors trainings uh, twice a year in Dallas, uh, tournaments that we run. We have one, as a matter of fact, coming two weeks from now. And uh, I, I don't behave in a certain way because I want to pass to somebody the impression that I'm a certain character. I do because I believe that's the right thing to do, regardless of what anybody else thinks. It's just like, that's my value, my core value is. And so I see guys like, you know, I say, for instance, drinking socially, or if I see an instructor doing a lecture and then getting drunk, you know, later in the, the same day, I have nothing against people drinking, you know, but I cannot put myself in that situation because this is in contrast, contrast to what I'm trying to pass off to the students. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But anyhow, like I said, I'm not being judgmental, but I'm just giving an analogy of one of the things I've seen guys behaving like a fool uh, outside uh, the training environment, you know, and trying to pass another aura when they are on the match. I think it should be everywhere all the time. What, what I'm hearing is, is the difference between responsibility and um, authority you what you're describing is because you have a, achieved things because you have standing you see that as carrying responsibility for what you say what you do on and off the mats that you have influence and there are so many others who see it almost as the inverse because they've achieved things because they have standing they are outside of the boundaries and they can act however they want because they're special and they may right. be special but it, it there's a there's a split there and and I wish more people realized that how they act anytime influences everyone. There are plenty of people, you probably know some just as I do, that you respect their technical skill, but probably very little else in, in their personality. Yeah. Um, I, I, think, I think there's a, a culture, a culture that has to be in place. Because you can, you can conquer the minds without establishing a culture. When I say conquering, not because I want to take over and control. Conquering means I have to convince them there is a better way, a better approach for them in life. Okay, so uh, I remember back in the old days teaching in Brazil. <clears throat> there was a point in time while we were still there, we'd have uh, occasional scuffles of jiu-jitsu students on the street, you know, young guys doing jiu-jitsu, they feel more confident, they want to show off the girls they go to, the nightclubs and this and that. I never encouraged that. And as a matter of fact, the ones, the students that I had, they knew and I warned them, I said, if I hear that you are picking fights with people, one, picking fights for no reason, and second, picking fights against people that don't know how to fight, I'm going to tell you two things. First, you are a coward, because if you're really serious about proving yourself, Go on a competition and go against somebody that can do something back at you. You know, then you prove yourself. But you try to pick a fight against a guy who is an amateur or doesn't know anything, you're being a coward because that guy cannot fight back. You know what I'm saying? So you're misusing what you're learning. If I hear you picking fights, you're out. You know, you're going to be suspended or banned from my school. And literally, I had all these top students that in, at different points in time, you know, they were kind of like picking fights here and there. And once we start to implement the rule, that thing went away, you know? Uh, and at that time, I didn't know any better. I, I just felt that's what we needed to do. And all my brothers were on the same line of thought because we were all instructors at the same place. Coming to America, of course, you know, nowadays I, I got several people that I reach out, you know, with our affiliation and so on. So uh, I do mindset. As a matter of fact, we had a mindset talk. Uh, once a week I do... Uh, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. to my whole group. And some attend live, others, they see the recorded session, you know, uh, and if you don't include the mindset, you can't educate people, you know, and, and you can't establish the culture. So once you establish a culture, it's easier to educate them into the reason why you, you do what you do. And since the results are so much more positive, uh, you know, we don't have to do much convincing for them to, uh, you know, adopt that kind of a mindset. 
you talked about implementing that rule in your in your school. If I did the math right, you were pretty young when you came to the U.S. and started teaching. I was uh, 26 when I first okay. came to the U.S., but I was already an assistant instructor. I was already a full-time instructor before I came to America. Okay. Um, uh, I became an assistant instructor at the age of 16. So I'm 50, 58 right now. So <laughs> let me do the math here. I don't even know what the math is, but it was, a, you know, 40 years, 42 years ago. Yeah, that's a lot of teaching. Do you yeah. do anything differently now when you're teaching than you used to? Have you, have you made any big changes in how you approach uh, the way I The way I use my language, I try to become more visual. Uh, I want people to see, it's kind of like show and tell, mm -hmm. more on the methodology part. And I try to uh, re-engineer, uh, for instance, when, when, you, when you have more knowledge, you look back and see, man, I wish I, I knew then what I know now. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to do is produce better white belts mm -hmm. than the white belt that I was way back. I, I'm trying to produce a better blue belts than the blue belts, than the blue belt that I was. So I kind of use myself as a gauge and bear, bear with me that back then I used to train more than the average person. You know, uh, I, I would have, um, not, not a couple six, eight hours a day, you know, uh, wow, weekly and, and on the weekends. Yes, because we did morning, afternoon, sometimes evening. When I had to go to school, you know, it would be afternoon and evening, you know, we had double shifts. And uh, it was just, we didn't even think much of it. It was just what everybody else would do at that time, you know. Hmm. You mentioned earlier that this idea that, that as you've aged, you know, staying humble, but also training smart. Mm -hmm. And you talk to any, any aging athlete, we're in this really interesting time where there's some very, very high level competitors, you know, Ke uh, Kelly Slater surfing, right? Like some of these guys who they've been on top of their game for 20, 30 years, whereas 20, 30 years ago, that wasn't the average lifespan of these high end athletes. When you talk about training smart and, and because as we all know, jujitsu can really beat the body up. What are you doing to train smart? What are you doing to recover that the yeah. listeners might learn something? Yeah. The last part, what you said, um, is um, it hits the spot, okay? Uh, the recover, the recovery aspect of the training, okay? For instance, I don't take any substances. You know, I've never used uh, drug enhancing, steroids or anything like that. Uh, has always been lifestyle based. You know, I used to do the Gracie diet since I was a kid up to the time I came to America. I was a vegetarian for like over a decade before moving to Texas in 95. And uh, more recently for the past couple of years, I became an adept of the carnivore diet. You know, I saw Sean Baker at Joe Rogan's uh, podcast and then Paul Saladino, which is the one I follow more closely. He even has an Instagram called Carnivore MD 2.0. And, and, and basically, uh, it was an upgrade on my diet. Okay, I, I do uh, red light therapy. I use mm -hmm. Juve. Uh, I do that twice a day. Uh, amazing results. Uh, I have a line, uh, uh, Machado Method Nutrition, where we have supplements from multivitamins, vitamin D, and all, all the different things, zinc, you know, immune, you know, boosts, you know, and all that stuff. D3s. So I, I do take with diligence uh, supplementation. Uh, you know, um, I eat clean. You know, I don't, I'm, I don't indulge. I don't smoke. I don't drink. So so I've always somewhat had a, uh, on the lifestyle aspect uh, a, a good bearing on how I proceeded. But on, not necessarily on the how I trained. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I was educated. You go all out every day, train hard and heavy. And, uh, and, and ironically, once I started to optimize my training, uh, I do a lot of tactical training. I want to get better at something. Let's say if I'm going to develop a move like a, the Kimura, which is one of the best attacks in jiu-jitsu. How can I do this 360? I'm going to do from the bottom, from the side, across the guy, upside mm -hmm. down, against the wall, you name it, standing down. Uh, so... So I kind of pick something and I try to really sharpen that. So when I roll with somebody, I'm kind of going half speed on everything else, but I'm going strong 
at that particular aspect that I want to tactfully develop, okay? Mm -hmm. The other thing too is, uh, what's your goal uh, in the art, okay? My number one goal is skill building. I want to get more skilled, okay? The way you build skills, there are two aspects. The way you drill, the way you practice your drills, and the way you train when you use a training partner that go, is going back, back and forth with you, okay? I'm a believer in resistance drills, resistance drills. Instead of doing a static drill, I just do the movie and let me do it. No, you fight back, always fight back a little bit. Mm. Always give me a little bit of resistance so I can trigger my muscle memory so I can map things out a little easier as I'm building up my skill. Secondly, uh, when you pick a training partner, okay, uh, you start not from the guy who is the best training partner and then you start with the bottom one, the easiest one. You go from the bottom up. Let's say I get a blue belt and exhaust all the options of my techniques with that guy. Then I pick a purple belt, try to exhaust. Then I pick a brown belt. Then I pick a black belt. Because that way, you know, by the time I get to the black belt, I had all those different tiers of uh, expertise that I had to face and go against. But on a, on a level that it was lower, so I had enough time to trigger and fine tune my muscle memory. So by the time I got to the black belt, the muscle memory is much sharper and my threshold is a, a much further. And the way you measure training smart is by threshold. It's not if I got the technique to work, it's how close I got to get the technique to work. So when I go back to the drawing board, instead of trying to do the whole sequence again, I'm gonna pick that last stretch, the last stretch that's missing. Okay, this last part here, I'm gonna start reverse engineering, you know, and work from the end backward. Because I already know I can get close enough to almost finish, but I'm not finishing yet. Mm. Okay, so when you do that, and then and then I I train a lot body positioning to be comfortable with pressure. Okay, so when I go against guys that really give me a hard time, trying to go all out, that doesn't mean that I'm going as fast as they're going. I try. Okay, I'm gonna survive. I'm on survival mode now. So almost like you turn on a different mode. So you just kind of literally imagine you're being thrown in the ocean. It's stormy, and you grab a float. Let the ocean carry you, you know, don't fight too hard. Just don't die. Don't drown, you know? And then from that point, okay, now I'm going to, you know, things are easing up the, you know, it's not as stormy. Let me build up again. So you have all those different nuances. Now frequency, I usually train three times a week. You know, mm -hmm. I roll average three times a week, uh, no more than an hour uh, in a session, if that. Uh, and I do mostly drills and teaching uh, in between. So, I mean, today I'm not doing any jujitsu. You know, I'm going to do more of like, I'm in my home office. So I'm going to be doing more stuff that's uh, not related to my body. Although I'm going to do some physical workouts, some, uh, some weights and stuff. You know, that's the other part too. You know, if you don't do weight training, you're not going to last. You're not going to last 100%. And I was not educated with weight training. You know, it's crazy. I don't know how my body was able to hold just doing jujitsu. And I mean, I did a lot of calisthenics, don't get me wrong pull-ups, push-ups, and stuff. But weight training is, is critical. I agree. You know, amongst all, everything else that I mentioned. So. You, you've talked about a number of things that suggest you may look at martial arts training, which most people think of as a physical thing in, in a different way. You, you talked about your love of philosophy when you were younger. You talked about law school. You described jiu-jitsu as chess. You're clearly a thoughtful person. When you're, you, you, you gave the example of a, of a Kimura. I would imagine that when you're training that technique and likely even before you are going in for what you described as tactical, a tactical approach to training that technique, you're probably sitting back and thinking. There's some period of time where you're contemplating how do I want to approach this? How do I improve this? Which over the course of you know, a lifetime of training in this art, you've likely trained it in, in a lot of different ways. So how do you unpack all the things that you've learned? How do you, how do you approach that? I, I, I won't put more words in because I don't want to lead you. Mm -hmm. um, when you realize how to ride a bike, you, know, you never forget the feeling, you know, the, the minute you really know how to keep your balance, 
how you kind of you don't let it go either side you hold yourself steady in the middle you you maintain your balance mm -hmm. once you're training for a long period of time it's not going to be the big stuff that's going to make a difference it's like small things small details small adjustments that will cause you to uh perfect your game let's say uh and things like that the thing with jujitsu Besides the analytical part, you look at a technique, you can watch a video of somebody doing it, you try to break it down. You have always to keep a keen eye on the small stuff. You know, I always worry about how is the guy holding, how, what is he doing with his hands? I start with the extremities. Okay, now the arms, now the core, is he crunched up? Is he extended? But then the hip, is his hip rotated? Is it flat? So uh, how is your shoulder? Is your shoulder shrugged? You know, mm -hmm. people that defend guillotines, you, 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 don't, you don't see guys that are really good at defending the guillotine. They don't shrug both shoulders at the same time. They shrug one and they throw that shoulder with it and they kind of deflect. You know, it's weird. You see small stuff like that. And that for me, is a big deal. I, I try to look for the. It's kind of like you put two pictures next to each other. You have that game. Let's, they are exactly the same. But if you pay attention to the second picture, there's a bunch of diff little differences here and there that you can mark, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so you got to look at things with a keen eye, uh, in regards to, uh, jujitsu, jujitsu about feeling too. It's not about just trying to visualize, you visualize, but you got to feel how he feels. If he feels good, if he feels is better, that means you're doing the technique the way you're supposed to. And regardless of the fact that, if you do the same technique against the same person for a time period, even if you don't teach anything to that person, they're going to become more aware of what you're doing and naturally start to oppose. You know, it's part of, because the guy is feeling what you're doing, whether he's learning what you're doing or whether he knows what you're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a degree that when you pay attention to the small details and you pay attention to how he feels, man, that that's like a leap of knowledge. Because not everybody pays attention to that. They pay attention to the bigger stuff. You know what I'm saying? And it's the small stuff. It's like they, people always say, the devil is, devil is in the details. You know what I'm saying? It's the small stuff that will make the most difference. So many people start martial arts with these, these expectations. And, and I think we all know that most people don't make it very far. They, they, they wash out. And the further we get in terms of progress and rank, the fewer people make it there. It's why, it's why so many people set out for those goals because they know that very few people accomplish them. Are you able to identify early on in someone's training whether they're likely to stick it out? Do you ever point at someone, I think that one is going to be a blue belt. That, that one's going to be a brown belt. Can you tell? I think, I think uh, based upon my experience, there are three components that I think uh, help you assess that. Um, the personality, how much uh, rapport that person develops and how long it takes for them to develop a rapport mm -hmm. with the group, mm -hmm. you know, with the class. Because uh, the social component in jiu-jitsu is very strong. You know, yeah. uh, they, they kind of like, it's, it's a relaxed martial art, you know, kind of like Brazil used to be formal. You go there and hang out and roll you know, and just go the flow. Uh, it, it's a friendly martial art. You don't have to hit the guy in order to beat the guy. You know, you can just, you know, control the guy, submit the guy, the guy taps out, start over again, high five and do it again. So there's a, a certain degree of camaraderie that forges, helps forge strong bonds amongst the guys. And so you, you it's not uncommon for you to see um, students calling teammates before they call family members when they have a problem. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a very cohesive group if the coach is right. You know, sure. if you allow egos to go crazy, you develop the clicks and it becomes a nightmare. You know, you have, you know, all these different guys trying to be stars and each group has a, a certain group of uh, groupies that kind of congregate around them, you know. So I always try to kill that off as soon as I see it. Uh, structure. Structure uh, helps if, if they know... Uh, you know, like, for instance, uh, you have a, a curriculum, you have a lesson plan. And, and, and I think, too, never eliminate the fundamentals. Okay, a lot of times people try to do fancy stuff 
and get used to the latest trend of the day. What is the trend of the times? Learn all the fancy stuff, but don't ever neglect the fundamentals because the fundamentals is the thread that ties everything up together. And that's what really a white belt and a black belt both appreciate that. When I teach a seminar uh, to many, in many instances, I have white belts with little training and a black belt who is top, top champ, right on the same group. Got 40, 50 guys here in this group. You know, half are really good, the other half, they don't know much. How can I teach a class to everybody at the same time that everybody gets the most out of it and walk out of there happy? I stick with the fundamentals, but I make sure that the tales that I show, whatever techniques the black belt has, is gonna up his game. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And and he's gonna still be in a language that the white belt can catch up with. See what I'm saying? So, and the only way you can do that is sticking with the fundamentals, which is always make sure they have a strong foundation. Because a strong foundation leaves less holes. They can get the fancy stuff and adapt, integrate into their knowledge, but they are not gonna be caught up on a day of reckoning that if they got caught in a bad spot, they don't have an answer for it, you know? So I'm not sure if that makes sense, but it does. Uh, but life happens, like I said, life happens. I would say you always having the martial arts to stand there over like a funnel, right? Uh, upside down funnel. No, actually, I'm sorry, uh, a funnel like a yeah, upside down funnel like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. So only you know a small percentage of all the people that start on the bottom will climb that way up to black belt. Okay, and these are, I don't think it's just lack of uh, commitment or lack of what it takes to be committed it's kind of like life happens man life happens uh people come and, and sometimes at what stage they are in their lives they marry they go to college they do this and that they might come back at a later time as an instructor all i care is that whatever window i got with that person i don't care if he's with me for six months six years for the rest of his life Whatever window I got, I'll make sure that the experience is to the point that he can remember. Man, I remember those times. I want that to be part of his or her memory. You know, a good time. You know, because that gives me uh, two possibilities. If he marries and has kids, he might want his kids to experience the same thing. Or if given the chance, if his life settles and he has then the opportunity to get back, which is not uncommon, they'll come back to it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It happens all the time. You know, yeah. but but the experience has to be there in order for that to happen. That's valuable stuff. So what's coming? What's next? Do, do you have things that you're looking at doing differently in the future? Um, are there are there changes? Are you do you see yourself continuing to teach forever? Uh, talk, I have talk to say about what's out there for you. Okay, so there are many fronts, right? So on, on a personal level, I, I don't see myself not teaching, you know, because uh, I always joke about it. You, you put me on the mats. There's no other place I want to be at that time. Mm. You're not going to have me contesting, worry about the, what time it is or checking my cell phone and stuff and being in a hurry. Oh, my gosh, how much time? I, oh, man, I, I'm in, on cloud nine. The, the, I can't explain to you the satisfaction, the reward that you have when you see a spark in a student's eye is uh, priceless. You know, so that part right there, I, I, I can't substitute. It is, the second part is the sense of mission. I wanna make sure that anybody who comes after me will have at least the, the possibility, possibilities of going beyond me, mm. you know, whatever, whatever I can give them, okay? Uh, and also another sense of mission, you know, with our association, uh, me and my partner, Adam Carl, we run uh, an association that has catered to quite a few academies nationwide. And uh, our goal is to change people's lives above all. Okay. Now, how do you change people's lives? Making them feel good about themselves is one of the aspects, but it's not the only one. You got to be able to uh, be capable of running your business and provide you know, for your staff and have your family taken care of. So the martial arts industry uh, or business, it, 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 there's a grit and a grind on it, mm. you know? And the problem is a lot of people who are good in fighting, 
they think being a good fighter or being champion gives them the credentials to be successful in business. And it's so unfortunate because you can go to a, a major tournament and see all those champions with the gold medals. But when it comes to their professional life, you know, they're still very susceptible and not yet where they could be, you know. So you got to attack both fronts, you know, black belt on the mat and black belt in the way you run your business or at least hire somebody or educate or have people that can do the job for you so you can keep your doors open and expanding. Because in the end, if I'm going to change people's lives, I want to have access to as many people as possible. As an instructor, my academy accommodates a few hundred people. And then after that, you know, there's no more physical space, okay? But once I reach out to other instructors, uh, the way we have been doing uh, through our affiliation program and so on, we, we can now multiply it. Now, if I have 100 instructors that have uh, 100 students, then I, I can reach 10,000 people. That's awesome. And then now yeah. we have the vehicle, social media. We do the Facebook Lives, which I try. The Facebook Live is no pun intended. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you something I haven't been through. You know what I'm saying? The same way, uh, if I do a technique and I teach a technique that's lousy, I mean, I, I, I'm reluctant to do that because I want to try it out first mm. to make sure I got the way it should be before I, I pass to you. Okay? Makes so sense. the same way about life. You know, I'm not going to tell you something that I, I don't do it, you know. Um, so, but, but if you ask me what I do, I'll gladly share with you what I got. So on, on the lives that I do on my social media, I try to reach out to the community. And it's crazy because when you talk about mindset, it goes across the board, the border, you know, in terms of people that have something to do to do martial arts and people that don't do martial arts, but the lessons they apply the same, right? On and off the mat, like I said. Uh I got a few things, you know, we have uh, our instructor's training coming up uh, here in Dallas uh, in a couple of weeks at the Marriott Courtyard Hotel out of Carrollton, Texas. Mm -hmm. For those who come to Dallas, I have uh, uh, the Carlos Machado Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Carrollton. We have quite a few affiliates in the Metroplex that anybody can find out, you know, uh, and uh you know, a few other, a few, I have a few other things cooking. You know, I got a coffee line called Stay Humble Coffee. Oh, cool. You know? Yeah. You guys can go to uh, our uh, website. It's called cmjjgear.com. So you can see a bunch of the supplements and the coffees and other cool stuff sure. in case you want to get a hold of it. I, I wrote a book uh, a while back on Amazon. It's a book on quotes. Okay. And uh, I'm not going to extend too much of it. I know we got our time going here. But uh, it's called putting the pieces together. Mm -hmm. So I wrote for a full year, one quote a day on Facebook. And people asked me, why don't you write a book? So I compiled all those quotes and added a few other, put in a book format. And oh, nice. some of the people, you know, it was just kind of passing on some of the things I've come across, you know. So I guess that's it. You know, uh, I can talk all day with that's you. It. It's always enjoyable. <laughs> it's, it's more than and I hope that could be the first of many, man. I, I, like, I like this format. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to start to wind down. I got a question before I turn it back to you. You ever thought about how many students you've taught? Do you have an estimate? Uh, it, it could be deceiving because uh, you have generations of students, right? My first black belts that have black belts of themselves, we have black belts of themselves. So now we have they call me the god. They call me the godfather of uh, jujitsu in Texas. I guess grandfather, if you can say that too. I'm probably like great great grandfather by now because I have a few generations of black belts yeah. already. And if you kind of try to measure the lineage, you know, it goes further down. You know, so I know it should be. I wouldn't be surprised if you, if it's in the hundreds of thousands at least. So, yeah. And if you include my brothers along with it, we're definitely mm. the millions. Yeah. It's, it's what, what you have done is remarkable. And I, I think what I find most impressive is when you talk to people who know someone, when, when, they, when they speak candidly, how they talk about that person, you know, especially when they're not prompted. You know, over the course of the years that we've had this show, your names come up in conversation. And I've had 
conversations off air with people and they've brought your name up in conversation and I've never heard anyone say a bad thing about you. And so that coupled with the hundreds of thousands or millions of students that you've had influence on, you're, we need more of you. We need more people oh, bringing that attitude to the martial arts. Um, so thank you. You're okay. very welcome, you sir. Do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any final words before we wrap up? What, what do you want to leave the audience with? Uh, I remember there was a, a saying that I read a while back and that, that brings down humility. I'm going to be succinct. Uh, the more you know, the more you remember. The more you remember, the more you forget. The more you forget, the less you know. The less you know, the more you remember. <laughs> if it makes any sense. So basically what the message was, is not how much you know, is how much you can remember. See you know what I'm saying? So anything that we do, you know what I'm saying? There has to be a legacy mindset in mind. You don't want people to remember everything you taught, but they, the, you wanted to remember what matters the most. You know what I'm saying? The experience. That that's it. I'll cut it. There. A little poetic, I guess. Yeah, that was great. Oh man, thank you. I was looking forward to this, and you did not disappoint. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you jumping in the Facebook Live and inviting me over. Yeah. And uh, uh, any of you uh, listening out there, if you ever want to be my friend on Carlos Machado fan page. I don't say that for any uh, sales pitch. I just want to share with everybody if yeah. anybody wants to stay in touch. Sounds good. All right, Jeremy. Thank you again so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. All and right. Take care. And if I can ever do anything for you, please don't hesitate to ask. You got it, buddy. We'll be in touch for sure. That sounds good. Take care. Thank you for thank your time. You. I had a great time talking with Master Machado, uh, just a wealth of knowledge, tremendous influence. There are very few martial artists alive who have had as much influence on the martial arts as he has, I mean, just flat out. And to be as kind, as an insightful as he is, um, what more could you ask for in a guest? I had a great time in the episode. I, I got the sense he enjoyed himself. And those of you listening or watching, hopefully you did as well, so. If you want to go deeper, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out all the resources we have there to help you get more out of the episode. Check out other episodes we've got. Maybe share this or another episode with a friend, somebody that you think might enjoy it, because that's how we grow. We do a lot of things to try and grow. Most of them work a little bit, but you know the one that works the best? When people say, hey, you know, I like what you guys are doing, and they go and they tell someone else. There's nothing better that we could ask for. Keep in mind, we also have books on Amazon. We have training programs at whistlekick.com. You can use the code podcast15 to get 15% off. And we've got that great Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick. If you want the whole list, all the things you can do to support us, whistlekick.com slash family. You got to type it in, whistlekick.com slash family. We update it once a week. It is worth going. Check it out. Uh, you want to bring me to your school? I teach seminars. Great seminars, fun seminars, informative seminars reach out. We can make that happen. We've got social media. It's at Whistlekick in my email. Whether you want to send me feedback or have me come in for a seminar, whatever it is, reach out. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.